Hi everyone, welcome back to the No Comment Podcast and episode 3 of the Watts Family Murders series. In the previous episode, we took a whirlwind tour through NK and Watts' affair and considered some of the key events that may have set in motion a sequence of events that ended in Chris Watts becoming one of the most infamous family annihilators to date. So in today's episode, we travel to North Carolina in the weeks before the murders and take a look at the Watts' final family vacation. So let's jump straight in. July 31st, Chris is on a plane heading to North Carolina. Before he leaves, he apparently gets a text from NK telling him to take time to fix things with his family. In his letters with Sherilyn, Chris comments on how this made him feel stronger feelings of love towards her as it took the pressure off. We all know how much he wants an easy life, right? It seems likely to me that NK probably did message him along these lines, But given her very recent behaviour discussed in the previous episode, where she fled the house in a hissy fit when Chris mentioned that he and Shanann were planning on having another child before he met her, sitting in the van for half an hour or so, clearly waiting for him to come and get her, unfortunately, she failed to take into account Chris's inability to pick up on emotional cues. I'm guessing this message was a facade and the subtext reads something along the lines of don't you dare forget how wonderful cool and laid back I am. Your wife would never say something like this because she's not chilled out like me. I'm breezy. So this next part we're going to discuss is only referenced in Sherilyn Cadle's book. Chris does not talk about this in his first or subsequent confessions. On his first night in North Carolina, Shanann wasn't feeling well from a headache. Chris, being the caring and considerate husband he was, offered to get her a painkiller. Smell a rat? You'd be right. According to Chris, on that first night, having not seen his wife for over five weeks, he decided to spike her with 80 milligrams of oxycodone, as he had researched on the internet that that dose would cause her to miscarry their unborn child. Okay, so whilst I don't think for a minute that Chris is above this kind of despicable act, here's a few inconsistencies I've pulled out. Firstly, in his letter to Sherilyn, Chris doesn't expressly mention discussing Oxy as a painkiller, just that he gave it to her. Sherilyn met with him in person a number of times, so he may have mentioned that to her in person during one of their visits for her to add to the chapter. Secondly, in her many YouTube appearances, Sherilyn appears to completely change the narrative around the Oxy incident by saying that Chris crushed the pill and put it into Shanann's Thrive Shake. Okay, what? Again, allegedly this is what he told her during one of their visit sessions, but it's completely different to what she put in her book and which makes me question why there are such glaring inconsistencies and why weren't these addressed by Sherilyn in her book? Another point worth noting is apparently you can't crush 80 milligrams of oxy because the tablets are coated in a crush resistant material. Our level, I really don't know much about this drug other than it's a gateway to heroin and should be avoided like the plague. But I read a load of comments from medical people saying they just can't be crushed. In a later letter to Sherilyn, Chris clarifies that he only gave Shanann the oxy once on the first night in North Carolina as the wording in his earlier letter is slightly ambiguous with an emphasis on the first night he gave her the drug implying that he did it more than once. He also confirms that he wanted to cause Shanann to miscarry so that it would be easier for him to run to the hills with his new love NK which sounds pretty much bang on in his twisted and macabre mindset and adds legitimacy to this information. So guys, the jury's out on this one for me. Yes, it fits the bill in terms of being fucked up and a warped thing to do, but there are clear inconsistencies with how he administered the dose to Shanann, which I can't deny makes it all a little bit suspect. But why would he lie about doing something so terrible? Well, as I said in episode one, I think he's loving the attention and continued intrigue in this case. Why not plant another seed of mystery to tantalise the true crime aficionados among us to ensure no interest is lost in this case? He also apparently told Sherilyn that he will take the name to the person who supplied him the oxy to the grave. Ooh, very, very mysterious. So I'm really undecided on this one, but do let me know your thoughts, guys. So Chris goes on to tell Sherilyn Shanann was very sick after he gave her the oxy and was up all night. In his interview, her father, Frank, corroborates this account that she was very unwell and that Chris was not the slightest bit attentive to her, not even checking to see if she was okay. 
The fact they both confirmed Shanann was very sick on the first night Chris arrived in North Carolina supports that he did give her the oxy on that night. As I said, I have little to no knowledge or experience, thankfully, with oxy, but from what I've read, it seems likely that someone would get very sick from taking such a high dose if they have no tolerance whatsoever. So cold as Chris refuses to support his wife given the fact he wants her to miscarry and apparently has lost all feelings of love or respect for her, or anyone it seems that wasn't NK. Shanann also tells her friend Christina over a text that she was very sick that week and had chronic constipation. Again, this could be a side effect from opioid consumption, but this is also a symptom of early pregnancy. And guys, I'm talking from very personal experience on this. So despite being cool as a cucumber in her messages to him at the airport, NK wants to speak with Chris and is getting very frustrated that he won't call her. He messaged to say he can only text and he can't speak with her right now. NK responds to say, why not? Are you with her? His wife, guys. His wife. Chris said he felt the pressure was instantly turned back on and spent the rest of the week staying as far away from his wife as possible, both physically and emotionally, so not to upset his mistress. So, of course, his priorities are in order. August 1st. After Chris arrives in North Carolina, the family, including him, Shanann, Bella, Cece, and Shanann's father, Frank Sr., leave for Myrtle Beach, where they have booked accommodation for the week. They spend the day at Pavilion Park, which is a location with carnival-type rides. The girls are snapped having a great time on the trampolines, as seen in several videos taken by Shanann. August 2nd. Watts receives a new horde of nudie selfies from NK, which gets swiftly transferred to his secret calculator app, along with the others. In the discovery, the investigator conducting the search of the phone data comments he thinks there was a lot more phone activity between NK and Watts than he was able to extract. Now, as we know, and we'll look into more later, they both deleted all their texts and phone records before being interviewed by the FBI and CBI, and only some of this could be retrieved. The investigator theorises that potentially they were corresponding via the secret calculator app. So I've checked a couple of the secret calculator apps on the App Store and some of them have chat features and also store contact information as well as needy photos, of course. And so it's possible. The discovery documents show that Watts deleted NK's number from his personal phone, which was saved as APC Health and Safety Environment when he was on the plane. And so maybe he transferred this to the app so that he could continue speaking with NK without being detected by Shanann. However it happened, NK and Chris were definitely in frequent communications whilst he was in North Carolina and were definitely having some pretty intense conversations by all accounts, as we will see from her internet history in a minute. August 3rd, Frank Sr. returns home and Sandy joins the Wattses for the remainder of their holiday. Since Chris has been in North Carolina, he has effectively completely ignored Shanann and has been very cold to her and the kids. Frank later commented in his interviews that he had never seen Chris be so authoritative and short with the girls and that he was getting wound up very easily over the smallest things. So objectively speaking, but of course in no way justifying, I understand why he was being distanced with his wife, you know, given his emotional and romantic interests were vested elsewhere. But being short and off with his own children, that's just so incomprehensible for me to hear a father be like that. Anyway, Shanann had enough with his whole demeanour and decided to confront him and call him out on it. Chris put it all down to the argument that Shanann had with his parents and that it had really upset him. Talking to her friends over text, Shanann clearly felt some regret over how the situation with Nutgate, that we discussed in the last episode, played out and that she tells her friend Christine that Chris looks up to his dad and that he's his hero. Later that day, Chris decided to go against Shanann's wishes and invited his parents to the beach to see him and his kids. Earlier, Shanann had expressly refused to allow them to join due to the sour atmosphere following Nutgate. So when Shanann found out that he'd done this and gone behind her back, she was absolutely furious and refused to allow it. That evening, Chris and Shanann got into a huge fight about the situation of his parents. He accused her of alienating him from them and she retorted that he had not dealt with the Nutgate situation well at all and should have stood up for her and the girls more. 
I mean, the guy's a jellyfish, right? He's got zero backbone when it came to Shanann and his parents. In his mind, he just wanted everyone to get on well and skip around happy in la-la lollipop land. When things got ugly, as of course they often do with families in real life, he'd bury his head in the sand and refuse to confront anyone with how he felt. And so the resentment grew and the anger grew against Shanann and the current climate with his family. August 4th, early hours, Shanann sends a lengthy text to Chris following their row. I will include a screenshot of this message in the Instagram highlight for this episode, but just to give you a flavour, here's some of the text. I didn't create a dagger between you and your dad. That was done by your mum and your dad and I won't change a thing. I didn't tell him not to come to the party, not to text or call your daughter on her birthday. I didn't block him on Facebook. He did. Your parents' home isn't a safe zone. Your mum isn't safe. These kids are my world and I will protect them from the evil in this world. So talking about Chris's mum. She's evil and willing to risk your daughter's life to get under my skin. Then talking about Chris. Something changed when you left. The pregnancy, you have failed to acknowledge it or how I am feeling. I'm not going to be treated this way for having the balls to protect our family and kids. I should get a gold fucking medal for handling it the way I did. Pretty intense stuff, right? It's a difficult one because although as a mum myself, I totally get where Shanann is coming from in as far as protecting your children is your number one priority and your main job, let's face it. But do I think Cindy was intentionally trying to kill Cece to enact some kind of morbid revenge on Shanann, who she's always hated? Um, no, I think that's probably quite unlikely. Part that really gets me is where Shanann talks about protecting her kids from the evil in this world when little did she know that the evil she really needed to protect them from was their own dad. It's just so chilling to look at this with the benefit of hindsight. So there's a fair few back and forth texts between Shanann and Chris on this issue. Chris predictably submits to Shanann and just thanks her a million times a million, whatever that means, for protecting their daughter and that his parents aren't innocent and all this. Shanann responds largely repeating points from her initial text. She reminds Chris this week marks their eight year anniversary when they first met and she won't forgive his parents for ruining the special occasion. So from Shanann's perspective, this is one of many events his family have ruined for her. Speaking with Christina over tech, she talks about how they ruined Chris's proposal, their engagement party, where apparently Cindy and Chris's sister organised the do but forgot to order Shanann any gluten-free food so she couldn't eat anything. So speaking as a person who suffers from a serious case of the hungries, I'd be absolutely fucking fuming at that. And apparently they also ruined their wedding because they were no-shows. In Shanann's mind, although the link here with their eight-year meeting anniversary is a little bit on the tenuous side, they have had some part to play in destroying all the big events in her life. She concludes the text marathon by telling Chris she shouldn't have to tell him right from wrong and that if he's not happy, he knows where to go. Worst summer ever. Okay, so let's circle back and talk about why I said NK and Chris were having some pretty intense convos during this trip away. She spends over two hours on Google looking up wedding dresses. Hold the fucking phone. NK, the queen of looking shit up on the internet, the chilled cool girl who wants nothing more than Chris to repair his fractured marriage with his wife, Shanann, spends two fucking hours looking at wedding dresses. I didn't even spend that long looking at wedding dresses. I went into the shop. I found like three I liked. Bought one of them. I was in and out in like 45 minutes. Two hours after seeing the guy for like five weeks. That's totally mental. So by now, you can probably tell that NK isn't going to be number one on my Christmas card list. No. My big ish with this one is just how disingenuous she was during her interviews with law enforcement. We will look at this in much more detail later, but she actively tried to mislead them and provided false information during their investigation of a quadruple murder involving two children and an unborn child. There was no empathy from her or any comprehension of the gravity of the situation and she just only seemed interested in preserving her position and painting herself as a victim. And yeah, I can see to some extent she was a victim of Chris, but she also made a choice to have an affair with a married man who had a young family and a pregnant wife, which she knew, she knew all these things. NK also Googles Shanann and Chris's Facebook account that day because, you know, she needs to stay abreast of the developments in their marriage, then consistently lie about it later down the line. 
August 5th, Shanann and Chris text about plans to see his mama and take the girls. Shanann is clear she doesn't want the girls seeing his parents but will take them to see his grandmother. Shanann goes on to say she doesn't want to be put in a position where she might run into them, as in his parents, if they go and see Chris's mama. She tells him, I'm not kidding, Christopher. Ouch, she using first name. It's such a stinger that. If my husband calls me Nicole instead of babe, I know that I'm in the shit. She goes on to say, I'm having a bad experience these last few days of my pregnancy and I'm spotting. So perhaps this is evidence again to support that he did slip her oxy on the first night he was in North Carolina. In responding, Chris says nothing in response to her pregnancy concerns. Nothing. He totally ignores it. Out of sight, out of mind, right? I'm sure in his fucked up mind, he was happy to hear that she was spotting regardless of whether or not he did spike her with opioids. One thing we can be sure of is that he did not want this baby. Later that night, Shanann texts Chris the following. I don't know how you fall out of love in 5.5 weeks or if this has been going on for a long time. I left you. You couldn't take your hands off me. You show up and I have to practically ask you for a kiss at the airport. She says in another text, I miss the smell of you, touching you in bed, you touching me, period. I miss staring at you and making love to you. If you don't love me, don't want this to work out, not happy anymore and only staying for the kids, I need you to tell me. Finally, late that night, Shanann texts, our marriage is crumbling in front of us and you can sleep. So Chris doesn't respond to any of Shanann's messages or if he did, they've been deleted from his phone and are not referenced from hers in the discovery. She is desperately looking for answers and to be consoled by her husband. But no, Chris's mind is elsewhere. The first phone activity for Watts following the flurry of texts from his poor wife is a Google search at 6.13am on the 6th of August. The distance from the moon to the earth. Okay, seems kind of fitting for this space cadet. Maybe he was planning his getaway plan. He's such a fucking deranged guy. There are no words. August 6th. The hostility between the two continues. Shanann accuses Chris of using her to have a boy and that was the only reason he wanted another child. Chris responds that he doesn't just want to stay in the marriage for the kids and that it was impossible to fall out of love in five weeks. So it's almost like he's having a conversation with himself here, trying to rationalise the situation with NK and his marriage to himself. I just find that was a really strange choice of words to say it's impossible to fall out of love in that short of a time, as if he's trying to say to himself, you still love your wife, it's not possible for you to fall out of love with her after eight years in just five weeks. He's just so mechanical, no soul. He says he doesn't know what's in his head, whether it's the pregnancy, literally the first time he's mentioned the pregnancy, or his parents and he doesn't know if he's scared or what. That day, Chris leaves to visit his parents alone. There's a bit of hoo-ha between Chris and Shanann about him returning back to the Ruzex as his dad didn't want to drive that night but could drop him tomorrow morning. Shanann, clearly not a fan of that plan, says she's leaving to get him but his dad ends up agreeing to drop him back. Later that evening, Shanann tries again desperately to abridge the gaping emotional hole in their marriage, but Chris is having absolutely none of it and brushes her off. Shanann, obviously feeling very vulnerable and alone, tells him that the issues they are facing are much deeper than a lack of communication. C responds, it will be okay, this will all get fixed. This is one of a few times he uses this phrasing, that it will all get fixed. And knowing what we know now, and the fact it's highly likely that murdering his family was premeditated, him saying this just feels really deeply sinister to me. So this is also the night that Chris tells Shanann that he's scared to death of having another baby and is happy with just Bella and Cece. According to Shanann, it was Chris's idea to have another baby as he wanted a son, but now he's telling her that he doesn't want the baby. What a fucking horrible feeling for Shanann. I feel eternally awful for her thinking how that must have felt. Not only is he telling an expectant mother that he doesn't want the new life she's creating, but he refuses to touch her, to comfort her in any way. I just can't imagine how this must have felt for her. And she was so strong to have been able to pick herself up and carry on for the sake of her two girls. The way he treats her in the end in the lead up to the murders is just beyond inhumane and there really is no doubt in my mind you'd have to be completely devoid of basic human emotion to treat another human like that not less your wife of six years and the mother of your children what a disgrace August 7th. Shanann confides in her friend Addie Maloney about Chris's latest revelation that he doesn't want the baby 
Addy tells Shanann that everything will be fine once the baby is born and that he's just scared. Later in the same conversation, Shanann tells Addy that she no longer feels safe with Chris after what he said about the baby. Mother's intuition is so strong. Oh, how I wish she honed in on the little voice playing in her head a bit more and got the fuck away from that man. Hindsight, of course, is a wonderful but mostly pointless thing. Clearly, what she knew of was pre NK, his role as a loving husband and father overrode any fears or anxieties she was having about his behavior. But we don't even know if that was his true character either. He could have just been playing the long game, which I actually think is quite likely. That evening, the Watsons flew back to Colorado for what was to be their final week before Chris enacted his evil plan to annihilate his entire family. Okay, let's stop there. The next episode, we're going to take a look at the week leading up to the murders and Shanann's thrive trip to Arizona before we explore the morning of the murders and the aftermath, including Chris's tragic and revealing TV interviews and his interviews with FBI and CBI. In the final episode, we'll explore in depth the different accounts we have about what actually took place on the morning of the 13th of August 2018. Thanks for listening, guys. If you like this podcast, please do follow me on Instagram or I now have a Twitter account, both are at no comment pod and I'll be posting highlights on my Instagram relevant to this episode and other bits related to cases I cover. I also have a Patreon page and I'll link in the description. I do this podcast all on my lonesome and so any help would be greatly appreciated and will go towards making the content that much better. I'm also in the process of creating some exclusive bits for Patreon users so stay tuned for that. I'm thinking of doing a few episodes where I'll comment on the interviews of Chris and NK with law enforcement and give my opinions on what they say let me know if this is something you'd like to see in the comment section or reach out to me on social media until next time 